Good morning from Bangkok to everyone joining us. We are so glad to see you all here. Today's spot the sesh is titled New Perspectives on Prehistoric Workshop Traditions in Central Thailand, a case study of ornament drilling methods. We are joined by two guest speakers on the topic, but before I hand the floor over to the moderator who will properly introduce them, we just want to remind all our Facebook viewers and Zoom attendees to participate in this sesh by letting us know where you are joining us from, commenting, and more importantly, submitting questions for our speakers. For our regular sesh participants, you already know the drill, but for any newcomers, Welcome, and please leave your questions in the comments section under the Facebook Live feed or in the Zoom Q&A box, depending on the platform you're joining us with. We will be choosing a winner from Facebook and Zoom to receive a spot for souvenir based on your questions and comments. Join me now in welcoming the moderator for today's sesh. He is our senior specialist in archeology span here at the Simeo Regional Center for Archeology span and Fine Arts. Dr. Noel Tan. Good morning, Noel. The floor is yours. Good morning and thanks, John. Uh, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this morning sesh. Uh, and I hope everyone is doing well uh, wherever you are joining us. Uh, if you are joining us on Facebook, please leave a comment and tell us where you're joining us from. And uh, for our friends on Zoom, uh, please use the chat box and tell us where you are uh, joining us from. Uh, this morning, we are going to central Thailand to the site of uh, Pompin Thai, which was occupied from the late bronze uh, to the early historic period. We are joined this morning by two Thai archaeologists, uh, Dr. Tanik uh, of Silpakorn University. He is joining us from uh, Khon Ken in Northeast Thailand, and uh, Dr. Wanapon from uh, Thammasat University. Uh, they're going to talk about some analysis, uh, some new analysis of beads from uh, from Pintai. And this is work based on an upcoming paper uh, co-authored with Alton Carter, Mark Kennerier, and Randall Law. Uh, so I understand that we have two presentations today, and uh, Ajahn Tariq will give us an uh, introduction to from Pintai, and Ajahn Manapon will talk about the analysis of beads. Um, so um, we'll have this uh, presentations first, and then we'll have a discussion after. Uh, and as usual, just um, feel free to leave a comment at any time or a question any time, and we will get to them at the end of the presentation. So, uh, without much further ado, may I get to um, Ajahn Tanik uh, to introduce us to the site. Good morning, everyone. Good morning from uh, Konkan. I am now in the rural area of uh, Konkan province in the in Isan, in the northeastern part of uh, uh, Thailand. So uh, I just uh, visit my uh, homeland to see plants, to see rice field, and so on. So I'm so uh, happy to uh, uh, to see you guys on the uh, on on Facebook or on this uh, platform. Uh, but before I uh, begin my talk, uh, may I uh, say thank you to uh, Noel to Spafa John, everyone who has uh, has done uh, this event, uh, uh, try to organize the uh, the event uh, for today's. Okay. So uh, let me begin with uh, the PowerPoint slide. <laughs> I have about twenty minutes, and yeah, uh, maybe John or, or, or Noel, can you uh, turn on my uh, PowerPoint slides? The first one. All right, give me a second. <laughs> Okay, yeah. Uh, as uh, as uh, Noah and John uh, mentioned earlier, if you have questions about about uh, my talk, about uh, also about Ajahn K, Ajahn Wanapon's talk, so uh, uh, please feel free to uh, to let us know. So uh, we will try our best to answer the questions and uh, and so on. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we are just waiting for the proper slide. Since I am in the remote area, I am not sure if I can uh, 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 do the slideshow from from my computer. So that's why I asked uh, Noel to help me uh, to do uh, to operate my slides as I uh, speaking. Yeah. So uh, so Noel, if you are ready, you can start with uh, the the first slide or even the second one. <laughs> Uh, 
I'm sorry for the con uh, for the inconvenience it may have occurred. Okay, so this is a uh, uh, okay. This is my first slide. Uh, so uh, the actually the topic that uh, I'd like John and Noel uh, uh, mentioned earlier is about these uh, the recent study on the stone ornaments from uh, the sites that I have been working for uh, for decades. So, uh, the name of the site is Pomatintai. It's located in Kok Samrong district of Lovuri province. It's about 20, 23 uh, kilometer uh, northeast of uh, the city of Lovuri. So not actually it's not very far from the town, from the modern town of uh, Lovuri. Again, my name is Tanikla Chalit. I am the full-time faculty member at the Department of uh, Archaeology at Silapakon University in Bangkok. So uh, uh, if, if you'd like to uh, get in touch with me via email or, or the other channel, you can uh, contact Papa, you can contact me first, and then he has my uh, my even phone number and, and, and uh, email address. Okay, okay uh, next slide, please. So the site that uh, we are foc we are focusing on today is Pomitin Thai. Uh, however, we will mention some other sites uh, that are contemporaneous with Pomitin Thai during the Middle Ages. Uh, or, or to say more specifically, is uh, Iron Age, uh, which is the focus period, uh, our uh, focus today. So a uh, site that are contemporaneous that have been uh, studied uh, and some ornament from those sites that have been studied are Saptampa, Pomonao, Nen Ulog, Ban Chiang, those are in, in the Northeast and Khao Sam Kao in Southern Thailand. Also Bandon Tapet in Kantanaburi uh, in central, in West Central Thailand as well. But uh, these are sites that have been, that quite a good number of stone ornaments have been found, particularly again and Canadians that, that are quite similar to those found at Pomotin Thai. Okay. okay, the site is located in, uh, in the temple, the, from now on, I will just say PTT, okay? Uh, PTT is located uh, in the modern Buddhist temple of Ban Pomotin Thai in Kok Sambong district. As actually, the, uh, the, the, the temple is part of the whole settlement, okay? Since the modern different uh, rice farmer, they, uh, they, uh, they plow the land and uh, they have uh, destroyed part of the site. Okay. So only the small area of the site have been uh, remaining, and most of the area are located uh, is in the modern temple of uh, uh, Wat Pomotin Thai, where I uh, did the excavations. Next, next, please. <laughs> okay, uh, I have done. Uh, Excavations at PTT since 2004 up until uh, uh, 2019. So uh, the most recent excavation was in 19 uh, was in 2019. So uh, so over the course of uh, uh, this uh, of long period of excavation, I have an, I and my team have unearthed uh, numerous uh, human burials and also associated. Uh, artifacts, uh, say grape goods. Okay. So there are a wide variety of grape goods that have been filed uh, together with the burials. And most of them are ornaments. And most of the ornaments are beads. And most of beads are stone beads. Okay. Uh, well, and, and glass beads. Okay. Next. Well, uh, radio carbon dating by the MS technique. Uh, of the rice chaff and uh, share uh, uh, and charcoal samples okay, uh, from the lab in Oxford uh, provide for the first time the absolute dating of the sites, beginning uh, showing the date uh, from around uh, 500 BC or, or a bit earlier okay, uh, to around uh, 500 or 300. AD or uh, uh, CE. So, but most of the occupation layers, um, the uh, the time period that we saw the heavy, the density of artifacts and uh, human burials are from, from the, the Aronids. Uh, even though uh, the, 
the 2019 have under a number of uh, maybe the late bronzes okay, without iron tools or, or, or iron uh, implements uh, that may be earlier. But we haven't finished the digging yet. Uh, since and, and uh, because of the COVID, <laughs> we have to uh, stop and uh, wait to see if we can go back. But uh, it seems already now uh, uh, due to the uh, the recent flooding of the site, so the test unit uh, was flat, <laughs> and uh, I would need to to uh, to do something else <laughs> to uh, to try to reach the sterile layer. But I do believe that uh, probably the the initial occupation of the site may may. Uh, may have begun even earlier uh, than than late bronzes, maybe late Neolithic, uh, according to the style of the pottery that I talked to uh, one of the ceramicists uh, who worked in Central Thailand, Dr. Uh, uh, Liz Pori. Uh, she she saw the portrait that I show her. She told that uh, she told me this might be late Neolithic kind of pottery. Okay. <coughs> Sorry. Next. However. Uh, the focus of our uh, study uh, is on ornaments from the Iron Age, or maybe the, the, the later uh, phase of Middle Age. Yeah. And uh, <coughs> almost all of the stone ornaments or the artifacts that, uh, of the sample that we use uh, for our study are, are from burials. But some of them are from non burial context as well, but most of them. Most of the stone ornaments are associated with burials, as you can see uh, uh, the uh, lower left uh, uh, photos. Uh, the, uh, those ornaments include uh, green stone, uh, canalian agate, and uh, some <coughs> sorry, and some other uh, stone stone that may be uh, 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 marble. As uh, I can have, I will have the photo of those later on, and also. Uh, uh, see the upper right corner is a photo of ear stud or ear plug. Uh, they are made from clay. So this site has is very rich uh, in terms of uh, personal ornaments, uh, not just uh, beads, but some other uh, kind of ornaments, including uh, uh, earring, ear stud, uh, finger rings, uh, toe rings, bracelets. As well as belt, okay. so uh, quite quite uh, uh, rich in 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 terms of uh, ornaments. Okay. Uh, apart from ornaments, some other uh, grape goods that uh, I have found from PTT uh, include uh, bronze axe, uh, iron implements, uh, knife, sickle, spade, horns. And based on the study of uh, different type of evidence from this site, we uh, we think that people uh, at PTT uh, since Middle Age uh, until uh, the early historic period, they subsist on a wide variety of strategies, including uh, hunting gathering uh, of uh, wild plants and uh, aquatic animals like fish, uh, turtles, uh, crabs, and yeah, and 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 some other. Uh, uh, water animals. And also they also practice uh, farming. Uh, we have uh, remains of rice and millet uh, at the site. So uh, uh, rice and millet tend to be, uh, well, I don't know if uh, uh, they, they were men died or not, uh, but uh, according to the number of the remains, they have very far uh, rice and millet remain quite uh, in good number. By the way, we have also far other plants remain as well, like cotton, sorghum, and some of the white plants, suggesting people subsist and exploit different kind of uh, plant food and also uh, animal foods. But one of the key, ac uh, key activities uh, in terms of cultural uh, activities uh, that we have found the evidence of it is copper ingot production, uh, copper smelting, and also ornament productions. So uh, in terms of copper ingot production, we have found uh, thick layers of uh, uh, slag. Okay, uh, uh, now Dr. Oli, uh, Oli Price uh, are working on the analysis of the metal uh, implements and also slag from, from my site. So we should hear the results very soon. And uh, 
to see if uh, uh, they have adopt different techniques of copper smelting at the other sites in the near, uh, the nearby site like the Kabumbutan area, Non Bala, Ninkam Hang, and Non Bawai, which are the uh, uh, the main uh, or large scale uh, uh, copper production uh, workshops. And also, we also found evidence of ornament production, particularly shell ornament production, okay, not beads production, uh, and stone uh, stone basin productions. Most of the evidence of those ornament productions uh, uh, include uh, fragments of unfinished product and also the drill out core of, uh, from the, uh, uh, of the shell and also stone, like the, uh, the photo on the uh, lower right corner. Uh, that is the uh, shell uh, dug out core. Yeah. And also I, uh, one other thing that I think that also play uh, an important role in the in this uh, community is the textile production. Uh, uh, we have uh, a very large number of spin clay spinning wool. Okay, like the photo in the middle, uh, this kind of small round uh, item with a hole in the center. So that is not bead. It's is is a, a spinning wool or spinning uh, uh, or textile production tool to make treat or yarn for textile production. We have a lot of them and uh, a wide variety of size, shape, and also uh, uh, decoration as well. And some of them even uh, were inter in the barrel as well, the, uh, the spinning balls. Next. Yeah, this, these are photos of add-on tools uh, from PTT and uh, from the surrounding site. Uh, so it is interesting that uh, people during this time period, in terms of subsistence strategy, they uh, uh, they practice uh, rice farming and millet farming, and might uh, and maybe other forms of uh, uh, farming of of other plants as well. But we need to do more archaeobotanical study uh, uh, at the site and the nearby site and and other site in central Thailand as well. See, but it looks like even though uh, we have found spared hole. Uh, or some iron implements that uh, that have potential to be used as weapon for maybe uh, I don't know if, uh, for if they have uh, if there are any warfare organized warfare, but based on bio archaeological study, we haven't found much evidence of uh, violence or trauma. So people might have used this the uh, the iron tools or weapon uh, mainly for for. Uh, 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 maybe farming activity or other activities rather than for you know uh, uh, protection or as weapon. <laughs> Next, oh, this is show the uh, the slag layer the, uh, from the copper smelting. So we have found a thick layer and uh, they distribute in a large uh, 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 wide area of the excavation unit. I would expect that if I expand the unit. Uh, from uh, the current six by six, uh, six by six meter unit to a bigger unit, maybe let's say 10 by 10 or 20 by 20, I am pretty sure that uh, uh, I will uncover uh, the layers of slag as well. So suggesting that uh, people at PTT also uh, smelt copper uh, to make copper ingot. So copper ingot is a uh, raw material for making uh, 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 bronze or making uh, alloy, uh, tools and, and weapons. So they are, they are, I think they are an important uh, trade item. Okay. Uh, I believe since that they are the copper ingot uh, are trade item because uh, we found a very few number of copper ingot intact at the site. Okay. Most of the thing that we've, uh, we found that, that is related to copper smelting is just slack and uh, uh, some fragment of uh, clay crucibles. And the uh, the bivalve mouth okay, for for copper smelting. Next, so here are photos of the uh, uh, bivalve mouth uh, for making uh, copper ingot. And but what is interesting about this uh, uh, this clay mouth is that uh, a pair of them was found as grapefruit with an individual. Uh, with an individual, so uh, uh, as I show in the uh, uh, photo on the upper left corner. Yeah. So uh, maybe this barrel belong to uh, uh, 
the copper uh, smelting expert or uh, specialist at the site. Okay. So this guy has no all ornaments, by the way. Okay. But there's only one barrel with uh, the clay, clay mold for making copper ingot at PTT. But again, from the unit of six by six uh, meter. So uh, next. Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, uh, most of the grape goods and are ornaments, and most of ornaments are beads, and most of beads are stone beads and glass beads. The uh, pilot study of the uh, compositional analysis of some stone beads from PT by Edison Carter uh, suggests that uh, some beads, particularly the agate and canelians, okay, uh, beads, they are the raw materials from not from local area, even though there is a mountain uh, called Kaumokun in Lopuri area where they, where they are source of agate and canelians. But uh, but we so far we haven't uh, found any evidence of the mining or the use or the exploitation of uh, the agate and canelian from Kaumokun uh, to make uh, beads or or some kind of uh, ornaments. So it seems like the again, and canon based from PDT are uh, import items okay, based on the uh, 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 compositional analysis. Okay. Next. This is another photo by uh, uh, Carter and Law uh, suggesting that uh, the source of the Canelian and agate beads might be located in northwestern part of India. So very far from PTT, very far from Robuli, very far from Thailand. So, uh, so there must be uh, some kind of a trade network okay, to bring those items uh, to uh, uh, some part of the uh, uh, India and further west to uh, further east. Sorry, uh, further east to uh, to central Thailand. Next. Uh, these are just a photo of some of the ornaments uh, found at PTT. Uh, the upper photos show the agate. So this kind of agate bits uh, that have a very unique shape. I think Ajahn uh, uh, K will, will mention this uh, in, in, in the analysis in her part when, when Ajahn K uh, uh, discussed about the, the, the analysis. Okay. The lower left corner, uh, are glass beads. Okay, they, they are. They seem to be pretty unique in terms of uh, uh, compositions. Maybe the one glass bead, maybe import from China. So uh, again, I, I I need to do more uh, compositional analysis of the glass. Okay, the one on the lower uh, right corner is Canadian. So uh, a, a typical kind of uh, form of kind of round shape. Okay, that. Uh, that we think it is import again. It's not uh, local items, not local uh, uh, good or, or object. Okay. However, so far uh, uh, the pilot study focused on the compositional analysis rather than the dealing techniques. So dealing technique might have uh, uh, the results of dealing technique might show different uh, or support the hypothesis about the use or the exploitation or uh, the trade network, okay. as uh, Adan K will, will, will talk later on. Okay, next. I just want to show uh, this photo that the, most of the beads, particularly stone beads, uh, tend to be associated uh, with, uh, with adult of both sex, okay, male, female, adult male, uh, Adult female. Okay. Uh, there are no specific gender uh, that tend to uh, that that show a strong association with with stone ornaments. So it looks like you know uh, uh, some of the uh, some of the group of the people have access uh, to this prestigious item okay. uh, based on the number of the distribution of stone ornaments uh, across uh, the site of, uh, uh, with the barriers we have uh, excavated so far. 
uh, it looks like almost all individuals have stone beads, yeah, but some will have higher number, okay? Some have fewer number, but almost all, okay? As it looks like people tend to be uh, quite equal, uh, or it shows that the lower uh, level of social stratification. Okay. This guy, like the uh, uh, better number 12, has uh, quite a, a wide variety of grape goods, okay, like uh, marble earring, bead necklets, uh, uh, ivory bracelet, uh, shell, blend, uh, shell bracelet, uh, polystone axe, uh, and some portraits. Okay. Next. Uh, this is, uh, as I mentioned again uh, earlier, that there are a wide variety of grape goods, uh, and most of them are ornaments. This slide show an individual with a different kind of ornaments. One individual with different kind of ornaments, uh, toe ring, finger rings, uh, anglet, bronze anglet, and the string of glass beads, as you can see from the photo there, and, uh, and some pottery. Uh, this uh, individual has, uh, is, or is very rich in terms of body or personal ornaments from the head to the toe. Okay. Next. So uh, just another individual with, uh, with ornaments. Uh, this guy with ear ornaments uh, uh, made from uh, seashell. Okay. So we found uh, a pair of earrings, okay. one on the uh, rib, uh, uh, ear. Uh, the other one from the uh, right ear. And also green stone beads. I don't know if you can see a small, just below uh, near the near the, uh, near the mandible. See, at least we found four of them, four of stone beads, four green stone beads. So uh, this is very, also very interesting, uh, the green stone beads. Uh, some individual has only green stone beads, not uh, agate or canalians. And again, we we uh, uh, we have found that uh, similar green stone beads have been found all over so, uh, uh, Central Thailand. Okay. And we need to know the provenance or the source of this stone. We are we are trying to get uh, the source of the this this stone bit as well. Okay. We have done some dealing techniques uh, as uh, maybe Jan Kay will, will will tell you guys. Okay. Next. Uh, this is an, an individual form. Uh, well, we did two units, two six by six uh, unit. This is uh, uh, another unit called uh, T uh, PTT S4 uh, uh, that it was found in 2019. So this individual, even though the bones, the remains are not in good preservation, so very poor preservation. Uh, but from our careful examination, excavation, and also sifting, we have found over 40, 40, 40, 40 agate bits from this single individuals. It's very interesting. Okay. Uh, no other kind of uh, ornament so far. Okay. Uh, the individual was interred with only agate bits. And this is the highest number of uh again bits with a single individual at PTT. Okay. And we select some sample of the again bits from this individual for our uh, dealing study. Next. And here are some uh, here are the photo of the bits uh, of different raw materials, uh, clay, oh, oh, sorry, uh, uh, shell bits, glass bits, stone bits or maybe uh, some other uh, uh, artificial raw material bits, bits that uh, made from maybe uh, something that tried to imitate stone bits, like the lower left, uh, lower right of photos. Next. This is a marble uh, pendant. We also use this one uh, uh, for our study as well. So there's only pendant the only stone pendle that have been found thus far at uh, PDT. Okay. And I haven't found any other similar pendant of this shape and raw material at the nearby sites in Central Thailand. 
So it's pretty interesting why, uh, you know, there are, there are a small number of these items. Uh, next. These are uh, the agate beads from PDT that we use as sample for our study. And you may have more details about it. <laughs> it's a funny show for us. <laughs> Next. So uh, during the uh, analysis, so we, 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 uh, we collect data. So we measure the size, the shape. So in terms of qualitative and quantitative uh, attributes of the samples. Next. Yeah, just just the uh, uh, we with uh, or we we uh, double check we test this uh, uh, specific gravity of the stone ornaments to see if they are why what if they are a why variety of, uh, of of stone to identify the type of stone. Yeah. I think this is this is right. Uh, next this is my I have to do, okay. This is uh, uh, my part for for the per, uh, first part of. Uh, of my talk. <laughs> well, thank you for your uh, uh, for your listening. <laughs> okay, Noel, so I turn the floor back to you. So, Emma, uh, do I do good time about it? <laughs> Twenty minutes. <laughs> yes, you are fine with time, and you can go on longer if you wish. Okay. But, uh, so I can come back uh, if if there are questions. You know. Yeah. Yes, so I, I'll, I'll remind everyone to please, uh, if you have questions, uh, especially if you have something that you, you need to know before, before yeah. uh, we end this session, mm -hmm. please write it in the comments or, or put it in the question and answer panel. Uh, we, will, we will go on with uh, Ajahn Jai's um, uh, presentation and then we'll have a discussion afterwards and we'll uh, address the questions and answers. So uh, Ajahn Jai, can I uh, put the floor to you, please? Right. Okay. Uh, I, I hope you can all hear me properly. Um, thank you again, uh, Noel and Spafa, for inviting Azantanik and myself to uh, present some, I mean, part of our work on the project uh, today. Um, and as Azantanik and Noel uh, said earlier, um, um, before anything, sorry, I forgot to share my screen. Just one minute. <laughs> Hang on. Um, all right. I hope you can, I hope you all can see my slide. Um, right. So um, as Ajantanik and, and Noel said earlier, the data from the study have, have been prepared for, for an article soon to be published. And so I won't go into much detail here, uh, but I will give an overall picture of uh, how we study and, and what we find in our project then. Uh, so probably take about uh, 20 minutes or so. And then after this, Adantani could uh, jump in for, for the discussion on the, you know, on the interpretation of the a different workshop tradition in, in Thailand or in Southeast Asia. Um, so uh, for, for the part of uh, drilling technology of the paper, uh, uh, Jonathan Mark Kenner, uh, Alison Carter and myself have uh, studied and analyzed the bead drilling technology and using the scientific methods uh, initiated in the latter half of the 19th century. And then these methods were uh, later developed and elaborated by uh, Mark Kenoyer. And, and uh, as you, 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 you all know that all the beads under study here were excavated under the direction of uh, Dr. Tanik Le Shan Lip. Um, and I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Adan Tanik once again for giving me the opportunity to study them. Um, as uh, I understand, and as many of you, many of you understand that it's, it's uh, very difficult to, to, to get a chance to study um, beads from excavated from, from, um, 
uh, scientifically excavated uh, context, such as this uh, corpus here. So, uh, right. Hmm. So what, what are the methods that we study? So we, we carry out a, a metrical analysis of the drill hole morphology, uh, the bead drill hole morphology, I mean, um, which, which means the, the drill hole dimension. And so we carry out, um, we, we, we need to measure uh, carefully the, the drill hole sizes, uh, the drill hole shapes, and then we, we have to carry out a microscopic uh, examination of the, the drill hole surfaces. Uh, these, so for example, here you have the, the silicone impression of the, of the bead, yeah? Uh, using dental impression materials, and then the, the measurements were done uh, carefully. <laughs> so every detail is count. And then, um, then after that, we take these uh, impressions to examine under the uh, field emission scanning electron microscope to observe the, the two marks that were left on the, the drilling surfaces. And then the data um, resulted from our examination are compared with the data obtained from uh, experimental and ethnographic uh, studies that have been carried out over a long period of time by Mark Kenner to help with the identification of the drilling technology. And then, and then the data also were compared with the previous, the result of the previous study of Alison Carter, uh, who many of you know that uh, has examined a large corpus of uh, stone and glass beads in Cambodia and in central Thailand. Right, so the total number of the beads under our study uh, are 57 beads. So, so they comprise uh, hard stones and soft stones. Uh, I, I, I emphasize the, the, the importance of hard and soft stones, I mean, the hardness of stones because, because the hardness of stone is important as a stone bead with different hardness, and if, if drilled with the same tool, can have the resulting different drill hole shape and drilling surfaces. And also the, the hardness of the stone might have determined the, the choice of technology used by the bead driller. So we have uh, agate, carnelian, nephrite, which are hard or relatively hard stone with about six to seven uh, hardness on the most scale. And then we have uh, soft stones, marble, uh, and probably serpentine, and then um, another one, an unidentified um, green stone. We, so so we, we need to identify these beads again in the future. I mean, um, we need to identify what, what beads are they, uh, uh, are these one, oops, sorry, hang on. Did I jump? Oh no, <laughs> how do I go back? Hang on, right. So, um, so the result of the study of these corpus of the 57 stone beads, then we, we, we were able to identify at least three different types of uh, drilling techniques or drilling methods. Um, the first type um, uh, is, you know, is, is called a diamond tipped drill, which is a, a type of drill um, uh, that, were that was first documented, I think, yeah, first documented in South Asia um, during the, say, the middle half of, and, and during the middle of the first millennium BC. Yeah, and this type of drill is, is as the name say, um, it has, I, I will show you the, the look of the drill later on, but, but the resulting uh, 
the, 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 the result of the drill hole uh, by this type of drill is something like this, something like um, you have a straight cylindrical uh, drill hole uh, shape and normally beads that were drilled using the diamond tip drill were drilled from both sides. So first the bead driller drill one side until more or less until the middle uh, of the bead. Well, this is in general, but there are exceptions. But in general, they, they were drilled from one side first and then stopped somewhere in, in the middle. And then the bead is turned over and then was, was drilled from the opposite side. And then when the two holes meet in the center, then, then it, it makes a complete drill hole, yeah. And then we, uh, we need to, as I said earlier, we need to uh, do the measurement uh, of uh, the, the, the shape, the length, the width, and the tapering value, the, the tapered um, of, the, of the drill uh, hole uh, very carefully. But in general, uh, the drill hole of the beads that were drilled by diamond tip drill um, uh, are straight. So they, 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 they aren't tapered as in, other, as in beads drilled by other types of drill, which, uh, which I will show you later. And then when we examine, so after we produce the, the silicone impression of the bead drill hole, then we take this impression to examine under the, the um, field emission uh, scanning electron microscope. And, and, and then four, and then we look for the two marks and we look for the characteristics on the, on the drilling surfaces. And for this case, for the case of diamond tip drill, then we generally get the, um, you know, uh, the uh, parallel regular drilling striae. So you can see here that you can see the, um, the drilling striae that are relatively regular and they, they run in parallel along the, the hole, the drill hole. And then if you look at the higher magnification of the drilling surface, then you, you get the type of texture that is quite coarse uh, as opposed to the smooth surface. And uh, generally it looked quite rough. You see like not smooth. And that is result from uh, the hardness of diamond, which is 10 on the most scale when it uh, uh, were uh, contact, when it had contact with the, the surface of the bead. And in, in our corpus here, all of the carnelian and agate beads uh, were drilled by, uh, appear, I mean, appear to have been drilled by diamond tip drill, yeah. Um, and this is just to show you uh, how the, the diamond uh, tip drill look like. So as I said earlier, the, uh, the, identification, uh, the identification of the, the, drill, the drilling method is compared with the ethnographic and experimental studies, uh, you know, carried out by John, uh, Jonathan Mark Kenner. And, 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 and then this is one of his uh, ethnographic uh, study, which, which he recommended me to, to go to the site and, and, and look at how the Indian, uh, contemporary Indian uh, bead craftsmen drew the beads. And uh, the tradition, this is quite, uh, this, this photo is, well, were taken from a, a bead uh, drilling <laughs> village, I would say, in Gujarat, which is called Kambat, the village of Kambat in, in Gujarat in India, where, uh, uh, this bead driller, I think he's the only bead driller uh, living now uh, who still continue the tradition, the drilling tradition using the diamond tip drilling. And so this is how it looks like. Uh, you have the, so the, the, the diamond are very tiny ships of diamond and then which are mounted on the tip of the metal shaft. Yeah. And then the metal shaft, uh, well, I, I can show you 
how how the bee driller drew it. And oh, hang on. So before I play the video, so you can see that the metal shaft here, and then the metal shaft itself is embedded on a wooden shaft, and then the diamond, the tiny diamond, which is mounted on the uh, the metal shaft itself, is used in perforation, and uh, with and uh, the 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 rotation, yeah, or the rotary motion is done by this bow drill, by the bead driller here, and then the bead is put in a vise like this, a wooden vise. Yeah, and it's quite quite a simple. I mean, it looks simple, but imagine in say in the old days, in about like two thousand or one thousand something years ago, this technique is is quite elaborated and it's not easily imitated unless you you have to learn from the the expert or the craftsman uh, himself. Yeah, so so so. yeah okay i will i will give him just a minute just a minute yeah okay oops sorry how do i um right and the other i mean the second type of drill that we we, we were able to identify uh is 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 a, a, a kind of method or technique called uh metal with abrasive uh, and as the name indicates then <laughs> it's the technique uh, which is uh, drilled used, uh, by uh, a metal shaft that are coated with uh, certain types of abrasive abrasive i mean it could be like a grounded stone with uh, with higher hardness such as a quartz or corundum yeah and the characteristics of the drill hole produced by uh, this type of drill is different from the drill hole that were produced using uh, the diamond tipped drill that you can see here. Uh, the shape of the drill hole is tapered. Yeah, I mean, by looking, you can already see, but uh, we, we also need to, to, to measure uh, the, the bead shape and then uh, calculate the tapering value. Yeah. Uh, so uh, then we take this tapered cylindrical uh, bead shape or the drill impression to examine under the uh, scanning electron microscope. And then um, we see that uh, the two marks left on the drilling surfaces are uh, again quite different from those observed on the diamond tip drill hole. Um, they do not, you know, the bead drilled from, from this method, they don't, don't produce a, a obvious parallel regular drilling strier, but rather the strier that you can see, he, it, it's not obvious as the diamond tip drill, the, the strier, the drilling strier. And then, in and if there are str drilling strier, then the strier wouldn't be as regular, and there would be something like discontinuous. Yeah, so so it's kind of different. And then when looked under a higher magnification, then the surface is not as coarse as in uh, the diamond tip uh, drill. Uh, rather, the, the drilling surface looks a little uh, smoother, but but somehow still coarse. Yeah, it's, it's, this is this is just one one uh, example. Um, the coarseness of the drilling surface also depends on the the hardness or the type of the abrasive used. You know, on 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 coating the metal shaft. Yeah, and uh, 
Um, so the examples of the beads that we study, um, serpentine beads, and then um, some net flight beads. No, not serpentine, I'm really, I think, yeah, sorry, sorry. Serpentine and, and some serpentine and uh, most of the, almost all the net flight beads were drilled using a metal with abrasives, yeah. And this is a picture of examples of uh, a metal drill with abrasive. Look how how the metal drill is with abrasive look like. So this 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 are uh, um, the drill uh, you know um, um, made by Jonathan Mark Kenner. Yeah, he's uh, doing his experimental work. Right, and so the the third drill type that we were able to identify is like we, we, we is appear, let's say appear to be something like a stone drill and stone by stone, uh, I mean, probably shirt drills. And the drill shape of the, the drill hole of the bead uh, of stone drill are, are kind of are different from, from the diamond tip, but somehow could be similar to the metal drills with abrasive, but they they could be more tapered. So so it's very we, we have to examine uh, very carefully uh, the difference between stone drills and metal drills. Um, but in general, uh, the diameter of the drill hole of the beads by stone drills are larger than those drilled by the metal drill. And then sometimes you get a, a irregular groove or drilling stride. And then you see this, the group here, some of them are larger and some of them are smaller. And uh, according to Mark Kenner, he, su he suggested that the, the difference between the, the largeness of the, of the drilling style uh, could result from the, uh, the ship, you know, the, the the stone tool, the stone tools itself that that the stone, the stone was shipped before uh, used to drill the beads. Now, and the shipped part of the stone produced the the irregular uh, drilling stride. I'm sorry, you you probably you can't see uh, very very clearly on the slide here, but um, then then if you look. At the higher magnification here of the drilling surface, um, you can see that it's the texture is could be coarse or, or or smooth, and it depends whether it depends on the the type of stone as well, and then it depends on the type of abrasives as well because uh, some stone drills may have been coated with abrasives before before being used to drill the beads. Yeah. And for stone drills, um, um, we it appears that the marble beads and some serpentine beads in our corpus were drilled uh, using stone drills. Right, and then here comes the important uh, finding in our project. I think, um, and all, all of us agree that these might there might be. A certain type of drill. Well, there might be a certain uh, traces, a certain traces that could uh, suggest that um, the local people or people in somewhere in Southeast Asia had adapted, adopted, and adapt a diamond tip drill because uh, the the drilling, you know, the the, the drilling characteristics. That we observe from uh, the flat uh, agate beads, uh, no, sorry, the flat agate pendants, such as the two here, and um, some beads, uh, some carnelian beads with um, uh, specific shapes, show that they were drilled using diamond tip drill, but uh, somehow the drilling method uh, are different. For example, the um, the drilling, uh, the the water diameter of the drill is generally smaller 
than the 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 typical diamond tip drill that we that we saw that we seen on uh, agate and carnelian beads uh, of other of other shapes, and then in this case, it appears like um, two different two different sizes of diamond tip drill were used to perforate one complete hole of of the bead. As I said earlier, like normally uh, beads that were perforated by diamond tip drill were drilled from both sides and then you know like from one side first and then turn the, the bead is turned over and then uh, drill it again from the other side from the opposite side but this one uh, the diameter is smaller and then uh, it, it was drilled from one side but using two different sizes of drill and this kind of characteristics uh, according to Mark and Elia, have not have never been documented in South Asia. So, so we think that it is possible that, as I said, uh, local people here uh, may have adopted the technique. Yeah. So future study is needed. Right, so just quickly sum up uh, that um, I think it appears that um, there are uh, at least three uh, workshop traditions uh, 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 that, that were produced uh, the beat in our study here. And the first one uh, using the uh, diamond tip drill technique. Uh, and this technique uh, could have, you know, uh, imported or, or came from uh, South Asia. Yeah, and this technique were used on uh, carnelian and agate beads, uh, whereas uh, the other technique, which is a metal drill with abrasives, uh, are generally used on uh, nephrite beads and other type of stone or softer stone. Oh, sorry, uh, other type of stone such as uh, serpentine. Uh, and then we have stone beads. Yeah, oh, sorry, uh, stone drills, which were used on uh, marble beads and some serpentine beads as well, and um, combined the drilling technology of uh, metal drills with abrasive and stone drills uh, with the shapes of the beads and the uh, type of the raw material, then we think that it's probably this type, you know, the, the certain group of beads, which are beads of nephrite and other greenstone beads, were produced uh, somewhere in Southeast Asia using Southeast Asian techniques. Yeah. But, um, but then we have uh, a certain group of beads, which are um, flat agate pendants and um, say like this one here, a uh, long barrel, long hexagonal barrel, which is a shape kind of, um, I would say correct, not, not characteristic, but widely found in Southeast Asia and, and, and in central Thailand as well. That, as I said earlier, that demonstrate or show the possible adaptation of local people from the South Asian um, diamond tip drilling techniques. Yeah, right. And I think that's it. I'd like to thank you, uh, the Bangkok Insurance Company for that financial support. And then um, for, we'd like to thank uh, the Singapore University Reinventing University System Program um, for their financial support as well. And we'd like to thank Mr. Chana Long Tapjui of the Center of Scientific Equipment for Advanced Research, Thammasat University, who has helped me with the uh, images of the scanning electron microscope. And then uh, lastly, we'd like to thank Ajahn Puton Pumaton as well for his support during my study. Right, so I probably hand over the floor to you again, Noel. Thank you. Thank you, Ajahn I, I uh, 
uh, and Ajahn Tanik, maybe I'll invite, invite you back on, on the screen again uh, for that really interesting uh, presentation on the beads and the, the production uh, the production methods that they use to uh, the drill into the, the beads. Um, I'd like to remind everybody that if you'd like to ask questions to our uh, guests this morning, please uh, leave a comment if you're on Facebook or put a question in the, in the Q&A box uh, on Zoom uh, because I, I, it's hard for me to catch up with the chat, so it's easier if I can see the questions on the Q&A. Uh, so we'll, we've already seen some questions on the Q&As. Um, may I already put some questions to you? Uh, uh, hello, uh, Noel. How come I could not uh, turn on my uh, my video? Also, so so you guys don't see me, right? <laughs> All right. I, I I think I I figured out the the problem. Okay. I, I think you can turn on your video now. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, thank you so much. Okay. All right. So uh, we have we have a few questions, and I will. Uh, put them to you. Okay. Uh, the first question is from Ian, Ian McCann, uh, and I think this is for, uh, for uh, Jan Wanapon. Uh, does drilling the hole in the bead from both sides uh, leave a step in the finish hole where the drill holes may not quite line up? Uh, I would say, well, I would say that what you mean by stepped hole means that the two holes do not meet uh, evenly. Is that right? I, I assume so. Okay, yes, I would was, I was say that. And that, and uh, I use your, your word, uh, Ian, I'm sorry, uh, the, step, the step characteristic uh, that you said, yes, it could result from uh, the two holes uh, not meeting evenly in the middle, yeah? And that depends on the skill of the, the bead driller. So the, the very the highly skilled bead driller would drill, uh, would make the two holes uh, meet perfectly in the middle, yeah, and without any stepped characteristic. Yeah. But there are there are certain uh, other types of stepped characteristic as well that is produced by um, different deal sizes, the two deals, different deals with, di with different sizes as well. So, so we, we need to look at uh, uh, the, the, the specific or individual bead drill hole to, to answer this question. Just now, Noel, I wonder if I can just add some, you know, my, uh, some thought uh, uh, from, uh, uh, from this study. Uh, from, from my own perspective yeah, uh, yeah uh, I think uh, we have done or yeah, Janke and the team uh, had done a, a, a really good job on studying the drill during techniques uh, for my point of view as an archaeologist so uh, uh, we have to we have to to know that first PTT has no evidence of beat production okay uh, no evidence at all of stone beat production. So all beat file at PTT are import item, either from South Asia or uh, 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 local, I mean local in South Asia, but not from uh, uh, not from Rupuri, not from Koh Samrong, not from Central Thailand. So uh, the current evidence suggests that, okay? So, but uh, uh, from the study, uh, as Ajahn Kay mentioned, there are at least three dealing techniques, you know, uh, 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 that have been filed from the bid filed at PTT. So this is very interesting. Why uh, people at the same time, you know, uh, during the other days at PTT, they continue to import uh, bids made from uh, other workshops, you know, made from different workshops. Okay, and it is interesting to see uh, to know as well that. Uh, the locally adopt uh, adapted technique tend to be used on specific type of beads or specific type of raw material or stone, like like you know uh, 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 the or shape of, of, of the beads, like the flat, the uh, uh, thin thinner and and a flat uh, beads, again beads, or even 
the uh, what is the thetanic uh, that tend to be used on uh, green stone. You know, it looks like with a, a larger diameter that uh, that we think is local. I mean, local in such Asia. Okay, that might have been continued from since you know since uh, uh, before before. As we know that there are some deal stone uh, dating to Neolithic or even before ne uh, before Neolithic, okay. that might be a, maybe the tradition that has been continued since you know uh, maybe upper Paleolithic or uh, Neolithic to the Aronids. Okay. However, as Ajahn Kay mentioned, we will need to study more in terms of the source of the raw material, Part particularly stone. The green stone bit, the green stone ones. We need to know where uh, those, uh, where are source of those uh, of those stone. Okay. For again, the Canadian, we tend to to know quite quite. Uh, I know uh, not quite a lot, but quite uh, uh, confidently. <laughs> uh, so most of them are from uh, from from South Asia, rather than from local source in Southeast Asia or even local source in Lumbri like uh, Kamokun until we do we do a, a, a more uh, uh, a geochemical analysis of those uh, stone sample from Kamokun. So, so this, by the way, I, I think for, uh, I, I still have some question why people at PTT during the middle years, you know, adult, uh, use different uh, kind of uh, stone bits made from different workshops. Okay. So is, are there any, I know, any further <laughs> uh, clues uh, to, to study them uh, in more detail in terms of uh, who import those uh, and, and, and why, or what's, uh, what, what is significant or meaning of, uh, of, uh, of the introduction of those beams? Yeah. I, okay. I have a follow-up question from that because uh, from what both of you have mentioned, you, you've mentioned the, the, the idea that there are different uh, workshops uh, evidenced by the different production types that you can see from the beads. But I wonder if, if those production types are, are really just dependent on the material of the beads. As, mm -hmm. as you pointed out, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Agate and Carnelian are harder, so mm -hmm. you need a, a diamond tip to, to drill them. And, and um, uh, nephrite is softer, so you don't need mm. Uh, it, you don't need a, a diamond tip to drill them. So maybe it's not, it's not really workshop productions, but you'd expect that mm -hmm. like if you were a, if you were a stone bead driller, you would you would know that this stone requires this kind of drill, mm -hmm. and this mm -hmm. uh, this other stone requires another type of drill. So it's kind of stone, the raw material choice rather than uh, tradition, cultural tradition. I mean, yeah, uh, 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 oh, I know, I, but but. I do agree with you, uh, Noel, that uh, uh, the different techniques tend to be as as limited to a uh, specific kind of uh, stone type or, or, or raw materials. Yeah, in terms of like like honey, so right? I mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I want to get back to the, the Q and A's from the audience because we have a number of them, and I would like to get through them before the the session ends. Okay. Uh, we have a question from Gina, and uh, I think Gina Palevsky. And this, I, she has two questions, one for each of you. Uh, for Ajahn Tani, uh, first she asks, uh, do you have any evidence for the type of materials that were used to string the beads? Mm. Uh, and she was uh, curious particularly about the example from uh, PTT where, uh, the, the, uh, where you have these beads around the ankle. So do you have any idea about the materials used there? Okay. Uh... For my part, no, so far I haven't found evidence of that <laughs> that, that, that Gina asks. Okay. Um, Maybe you um, know uh, uh, in, in the future, if we again if, if we do a, a re-excavation, I mean expand the unit or or, or dig in uh, other parts of the site that I don't know. Yeah. And it's the same question for Jan Do you, do you find do you find uh, in your drilling techniques and analysis, do you find any indication of what the what the stringing material might have been? Um, from from my study of the stone beads in found in Thailand, no, I haven't find I haven't found any. But from my study of the stone bead found in Afghanistan, found in the um, stupa deposits of uh, uh, 
uh, surpass in Afghanistan of the say uh, contemporary contemporary period uh, uh, with the 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 stone beads from Promatintai, which is early historic in the South Asia. Then yes, I found one evidence of uh, say. Um, um, string and the string is like um, I I don't know the, the the types of material. I'm sorry, I don't really want to say what it is. But yes, I I I that that there was that is one case that 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 there is, is a tr like traces of string mm, mm, still inside the the agate barrel mm, bead. Mm, yes, mm, mm, yes. Mm, mm, mm. I I assume well, you're not saying because it's not published yet, right? <laughs> uh, it's it's not published yet, but it's mentioned somewhere in the catalog in the museum catalog of the British Museum. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but but talking about string, uh, as I mentioned, that the we have found uh, quite a lot a large number of clay spinning rolls that uh, that are tools for making yarn or thread. You know, uh, they well well there's there's string for sure, but uh, those string but those string make and not having juice uh, in, in, in the uh, production of uh, the beads. <laughs> they, uh, those strings might be used for other, for other purpose, for other functions, yeah. All right, uh, the next question is from uh, DZ. Uh, it's a simple one. What was the metal used in the metal drills? Uh, would you like to say something at Antonique or would you prefer me to? I will ask you to answer this question. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Maybe you could help as well because I think uh, well, according to Mark Kenner, he said that the, the metal, the type of metal used to perforate stone beads of hard, of relatively hard stones could be, you know, or, or must have been quite hard, you know, something like iron or some, something like steel shaft uh, copper could have been used as well but as copper is not as hard as iron and it could as well break <laughs> during the process of drilling uh -huh. but as we said we haven't found any evidence yes as Antonique yes. said yeah, earlier yeah. Yeah. We, well so, you know uh, uh, I, I i can say with higher level of confidence that uh, most of the iron uh, tools or iron items for uh, PTT are quite clear. They show, they tell us they are, they are tools, they, they, like they are knife, they are spade, they are holes, they are sickle, uh, not as something that might be illegal or uh, specific in form that may have you, uh, they have been used for other functions, like, like for, for drilling. So I still do strong, strongly believe that all the bits for PTT were not drilled, were not manufactured at PTT. <laughs> All right, and uh, last question from uh, Ian McCann. Uh, and, and this is something for, for the Thai archeologists because I have no idea about this one. Um, how many burials have been found from cultures that use metal with no metal in burials? Say it again, Noel. I'm sorry. <laughs> I can hear you properly. Sorry. Right. Do you do you have do you have uh, cultures in Thailand? I, I can think of one. In uh, Thailand or in uh, uh, PTT? Uh, it could be in PTT, but it could be in Thailand as well. Uh, I, uh, that you have uh, that they are metal cultures, so Iron Age, Bronze Age, but they don't have any metal in the burials. Ha. Huh. So why? Uh, good question. <laughs> uh, I cannot say with confidence that uh, I know this, uh, or, or, or I cannot answer this question uh, uh, with, with confidence. But however, we found some sites with deposit or with uh, uh, cultural tradition uh, uh, with no no iron, but just just bronze and, and 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 other kind of artifacts okay so that sometimes we just you know uh, uh, label them as as bronzes okay so once we found uh, bronze uh, bronze and 
iron objects. So we tend to, you know, to to uh, uh, to call or to uh, uh, no mean, uh, uh, to call them that iron it. I don't know if this is the answer. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was just wondering about that too, Ian. I don't know whether you, you, you may need to clarify that question a bit, but it's, it's a bit like asking, do you find a Bronze Age culture without any bronze in the, in the site? And I'm, oh. I'm not sure if that's a, a, I a... Yeah, yeah. Well, well, how could we say Bronze Age without bronze? <laughs> <You know? laughs> uh, or, or other, other kind of... Uh, well, pottery, sometimes we use pottery as a star marker, but branches, pottery, also quite, they have unique, you know, unique, uh, unique star, unique uh, uh, characteristic from the Neolithic, you know, quite, quite uh, distinctively, you know, in, in such Asia or in Thailand, yeah. All right. Uh, so, I'm sorry, Ian, we don't really have a definite answer for you. Uh, we're, we're turning up. <laughs> Uh, I, I have one last question, I think, before we wrap up. Uh, and it's something that you showed, uh, Tanik, in your slides. But can you tell me more about the earplugs? The what? How, the earplugs. You uh -huh. said, uh, how do you know they were earplugs? Were they like burials and you found them in the ears? Or Okay. Okay. Good question, Noel. Earplug. Okay. Uh... See, I have read a num uh, some papers uh, uh, by American archaeologists who work in India. Okay, they she she uh, she's from UCLA. Uh, she uh, mentioned a kind of clay object looks like the the ear stud or ear plug, you know, uh, the tip file from her excavation in India, and uh, and she mentioned it or she called those items ear plug. Or, or, or a broader uh, word, ear ornament, okay? And also Liz Pori, uh, who also worked at Thai Care and some other sites, she also uh, wrote a paper and mentioning uh, the discovery of uh, the ear plug or ear stud, like from, from, from Thai Care. Uh, so yeah, uh, and the size and shape of those clay items that yeah you know, they look pretty much like the uh, the the earplug that even modern teenagers use nowadays, you know. Uh, and uh, this type of ear ornaments have been found almost exclusively in central Thailand and, uh, and and some part of Izan and some part of the Kola Pado. But most of them, most of them uh, have been found in central Thailand uh, during the bronzes or during the Middle Age. Okay. FPT we found quite quite a lot. I mean a lot maybe over over 50. Okay. Uh, from both very context and non very context. And at other side like Thai Care I mentioned Thai Care uh, uh in the console one and also Punoi, also Ilaburi. Yeah, they have uh, found the, the ear stud or ear plug as well. Okay. Even though uh, we haven't found the ear plug in direct association in the ear area, okay? But what, well, uh, the shape, the size, the form, the style, and the uh, other study, you know, suggests that those are, are ear ornaments. <laughs> so I, I still uh, like to call them as uh, ear plug or ear stud. Not Fair hearing. Enough. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. All right. Uh, in, in that case, I, I think I don't see any more questions in the, the Q&A box. Uh, and with that, I think it'll probably be a good time to, to wrap up for this session. Okay. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Ajahn Tanik and Ajahn Wanapong, for sharing your knowledge with us. Uh, I learned something um, new today, and I, I hope uh, many of you in the audience learned something new today. Uh, so, John, uh, take it away. All right. Thank you, Noel. And thank you, Dr. Wanaporn and Dr. Tanik for being our guest speakers in today's Fafa Sesh. Also, thank you to all our Facebook viewers and Zoom attendees for joining this Fafa Sesh live. And especially if you participated with questions and comments, we will be in contact with the winners very soon. We would also appreciate it if you could let us know what you thought about today's sesh by completing the evaluation. Um, the link should have been shared in the comment section of each platform by now. And if you'd like to rewatch this sesh, a recording of it will be immediately available on SPAFA's Facebook page 
or you can also visit Spafa's YouTube channel to view all of our past Spafa sessions on there. So until we meet again at our next Spafa sesh titled Development of Traditional Theater in Southeast Asia on 1st September, take care and keep safe. Goodbye.